If you have your Bible, by the way, I'm asking you if you have one, if you do not own a Bible, you'll notice right there in the pew rack, there is a black Bible. If you don't own one, please take that Bible and take it home with you as a gift from us this day so that you will have your own copy of God's Word at home because uh, everything we do and say is based on the Word of God. Now, many of you, when you walked in this morning, you were handed one of these beautiful things right here, the bulletin. Now, I want you to understand when you hold this to most Baptists, and I bet other denominations have the same problem, this is where, this is where you keep secret information because nobody reads it. I'm just saying, nobody ever reads them. And somebody's looking, I read every line, Pastor. That's because you're looking for the errors, okay? Did we proofread it well? But I have a use for it today, okay? Here's what I need you to do. I need you to find Exodus 17 and stick your bullet in there. Can you do that for me? That'll hold your place. Now, I gotta give this man his back or he won't be able to handle it, okay? You found Exodus 17 for me? Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And while you're turning, you know, I, I got to ask you a question. Y'all, you know how there's a bunch of sayings that aren't biblical but you think are biblical? There's a bunch of them, right? And we're going to talk about this wilderness journey that God's got us on. And, but, but, I, but I, you know, there, there's a bunch of them out there, like the one where it says God helps those who help themselves. That ain't in Scripture, people. Okay? It ain't there. It's not there. It is not there, okay? It's not. Another thing is, is, is you hear people often say, God will never give you more than you can handle. You heard that? It's not true. It's not true. In fact, God gives you more than you can handle for a specific purpose. And that is so we have to live in dependence upon him. Listen to this passage Paul wrote when he was writing to the Corinthians. And this is, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And pick up in verse 8 with me if you would. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia. Now, real quick. Wait a minute. This is, this is Paul. He's doing everything for Jesus. His life should be perfect. It should be roses and daffodils, right? He says, I don't want you to be fooled, people. It's not easy walking in the footsteps of Jesus. It's not easy walking in the service of God. He's just being straight. He says, I don't want you to be unaware of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened ex excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Does that sound like God gave him more than he can handle? Sure does to me. But listen to why. Listen to why. It says, more than we could handle, verse 9, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves. Yeah, I know I'm bringing that out there for you, but I need you to catch that. So that we do not trust in ourselves, big word but right there, but in God who raises the dead. But in God. Can I tell you something? You, me, we cannot save ourselves. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot forgive ourselves. Only God has the power to forgive, to save, and to change. I want you to get that through your mind. Because there's a lot of people going, you got the power in you. You don't. You don't have it at all. Our God is the one who has the power. And the reason that God has the children of Israel out in the wilderness is so that they can learn to be dependent upon him. It's that simple. He wants them totally and completely dependent upon them and no one else, on him and no one else. But as we study the passage today, we're going to catch that it takes a whole lot more. You know, you see, we, we, will never, we will never see our need until, until we strip away our self-sufficiency, and then we will really see how weak we are. Listen, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and I'm just reading it for you real quick. You can jot it down. It says, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 
Just remember that. Remember, if you're not weak, you're not vulnerable to God, then you're missing out on the blessing. Then you're doing it all by yourself. Matthew 11, 11, 11, 20, 11 28, it says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It doesn't say, hey, take that yoke off your back, throw it down, okay, because you can rest. No, he says, if you're wore out and you're weary from doing it all by yourself, come see me, because I'm the one that gives rest. God is the one that gives rest. God is the one who gives power. So when we look at our passage today in, in Exodus 17, go ahead and get back over. That's why that bulletin's there, right? We need to understand that God has them out there for a reason. He's about to give them more than they can physically handle. Listen to the passage. It says in verse 1, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by the stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord. And they camped. And what was not there? There was no water for the people to drink. God was surprised. No. God's never surprised. God knows everything. He commanded them to go there. He knew there was no water there. And yet he sent them anyway. Because, see, they had a spiritual problem. They were spiritually dry, dehydrated, whatever words you want to say. They have a spiritual problem, and God is going to use a physical fix to get their attention, a physical problem to do it. You see, when, when, where, phys, where the physical, when we get out in the wilderness, when our physical shortcomings start to show up, it starts to reveal our spiritual problems and our spiritual issues that are there. We're pretty good at looking like a good looking person at church, right? Dressed right, dressed well, fixed the hair perfect, wore the right hat, all of that kind of stuff. But what's really going on on the inside, we don't have a clue. But I tell you what, when you're put under pressure, when you're put under strain, that's when the rubber meets the road. That's when we find out where your faith is. God put them there. God put them in a place of stress and suffering and struggle for his glory, for his purpose. There's no water for the people to drink. Verse 2, it says, Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and they grumbled against Moses and 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 why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst so Moses cried out to the Lord saying that saying what shall I do to this people a little more and they will stone me Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Long before Black Lives Matters were blocking highways and um, Occupy Wall Street did their thing and the goobers at, at UC Berkeley did their thing, there was, there, there was the Israelites. The children of Israel threw a protest. And they weren't just throwing any protest. They were throwing one and such. They were ready to pick up stones and kill a man. It was a big deal. We see that word quarrel and we think, oh, there was a little quarrel. You had a little argument. No, they were, they were fighting mad. If you could read it in the Hebrew, you'd be like, whoa, that's a loaded word. That's one of those words where they want to smack you around, slap you good. You get the idea, right? You're with me? All right. Okay, just checking. This is Baptist, amen, I get you. All right. But so, so we've, got a, we've got a horrible situation. These, guys, these folks have no water. They have no hope. They feel like they've been brought out here for no reason, and they automatically attack the man, remember I said the physical reveals the spiritual. The physical reveals the spiritual. Realize this for a second. They are attacking Moses. Wait a minute. Don't you think if Moses knew where some water was, he'd tell them? They were asking him as if he was hiding the water source. Like he had some big giant water tower hidden out in the desert. That's how bad they were doing. Folks, I'm just going to let you know right now. 
I don't care how much you protest. I don't know how, how much you, you beg your mom and daddy to buy you something or you don't like the situation. I don't, I don't care how much you, you protest and try to get the government to do something different. They can't fix you, save you, change you, or do anything special for you. They can't. And these people were thinking that Moses somehow could wave his magic wand and some water was going to show up. Folks, don't you know that in the days up to this, that Moses was sending out people everywhere to go find water anywhere, anyhow? Don't you think the people were doing that themselves? Folks, I'm going to tell you, when you're without water, you get desperate. You get desperate because without water, you will die. You know, there's the rule of three. Three minutes without air, you'll die. Three minutes in a harsh environment, extremely harsh, you will die. Three days without water, you will die. Three weeks without food, you will die. And these folks were desperate. They had food, it was coming from heaven, right? But they needed water. They needed water and they were begging the wrong person. And God was trying to prove to them and show them that it is not Moses that is their source of blessing, but God Almighty himself. God is the source of blessing. God is the one that will bring the rain, who will bring the water. God is the one that brings salvation and forgiveness and all the blessings. It is God, not Moses. What would it have accomplished if it had killed Moses? It would still been without water, wouldn't he? Still been just as thirsty. You know, that's the thing about, that's the thing about when we become spiritually depraved. What we figure out is they went and, and, and went after Moses, but what they should have done is what Moses did. What did Moses do? It says it right there in the passage. Moses said, Lord, I've sent everybody. I've looked under every rock. There is no water anywhere, and these people are going to kill me. Just saying. They're going to kill him. Oh, folks. And he begs to God. You know, too many Christians, when they, when they reach out to God, they pray about half-hearted. Y'all remember crossing your fingers, right? Both of them. You got that? I mean, some of y'all can do all of them, right? That'll give your kids something to do while I preach more. Um, or we could do it. Just crazy. Never mind. Go Spock. Okay. Let me tell you something. God doesn't want half-hearted prayers. God wants and wanted the people there. The reason they were in the wilderness, the reason there was a shortage of water was so that they would cry out to him and see their total and complete dependence upon him. You see, the physical always reveals the spiritual. You know, none of us struggle with water. But some of us struggle with that rule of three. Because the desire to worship, some of you are, are just as regular as the day is long. Others of you, if you've got nothing better to do, you'll go worship Jesus. Many times, other things become more important than the regular gathering and worshiping of Jesus. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I've told parents all the time. You kids got, a, you got an event? I bet you there's a church in that town and you tell the coach enough times that your kid won't be there because they're worshiping. They'll get the hint that games on Sunday are no good. But the more time we spend away from worship, see that's a physical separation from God's instructions. What happens is, is it's revealing your spiritual priorities. It's revealing where you are spiritually. Is God the priority or is he not? Is the worship of God the most important thing? You know something on vacation? It's one thing to miss a weekend. Who, you know, one, one Sunday's not going to hurt you. But when you miss multiple weekends and you know you're going to be away, you need to find a church wherever you're vacationing, wherever you're traveling to. Because can I tell you something? God's word is proclaimed all over this world. And if they ain't doing it where you're at, pull your Bible out, sing some songs, and praise God in a formal manner with your family. Don't play this game. Well, I read my Bible and I prayed I'm okay. No. God said, even, even God himself took a day off 
which for, for rest and that day off turned into a day of worship in the New Testament church. Amen? I didn't make this stuff up. God's the one that said it. And that is how we draw closer to him. That's how we continually get what we need spiritually. And see, not only with, with church attendance, and I'm just picking on church attendance, but what happens when we spend too much time out of God's word? You know, that day you get up and go, I just don't feel like reading it this morning. I don't feel like kneeling before God and praying to him. That day turns into two days. That two days turns into three days. And instead of being close in your walk with God, you're distant. You're far from God. You wake up one day and you're screaming at the preacher going, why am I not growing deeper? You know, I just don't get nothing out of your messages anymore, preacher. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. I ain't the source of your spiritual growth. God is. And your spiritual growth begins on your knees at home. It begins in the Word of God, in personal Bible study, and it goes farther into Sunday school. If you're, if you're skipping out on Sunday school, you're missing out on growth in Christ. And maybe, that, maybe it doesn't work out, but we have Bible studies on Wednesday night. We have them on Wednesday. I mean, we'll do whatever. You come to me and tell me that there is no situation in this world in which time works when we do regular Bible studies. I, we will invent one for you. Because we're serious about you growing deeper in Christ. We're serious about your spiritual condition. We're serious about where your soul is currently. You see, our physical reveals our spiritual. If God is a priority in our heart, if God is a priority in our lives, it shows in the way we spend our time and the way we spend our money. I'll tell you what, you show me your pocketbook, whether you're tithing or not. And that'll get your attention. I even told that to the early service, and that was kind of funny because those senior adults, you know they're giving to God. Pray about that. Listen, listen, he's, he's trying to get a hold of them, and Moses does the one thing he can. He's in the wilderness, and finally his physical is reflecting his spiritual need, and he's begging God for some help. Does God ignore him? No. God doesn't ignore him. Verse 5, it says, For the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Egypt, or, or Israel, boy, that was bad, uh, of, of Israel, and take in your hand, take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Before I will stand before, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. That the people may drink. You see, God proves his presence even in the driest conditions of the world, even in the driest spiritual conditions. I don't care how far you've drifted from God. Can I tell you, he is just one turnaround and he's there. All you've got to do is repent and turn to him. He is not far. You just got to change directions. For them, it was going out to the rock, taking that staff and hitting the rock because God stood there. Because God was going to make water where nothing could happen. I mean, have you ever seen water come out of a rock? I hadn't. I'm just saying, you know it's a miracle. It's an amazing thing when God works and when God does. But you know something? Sometimes the physical act of serving God becomes unspiritual. Sometimes the physical act of serving God becomes unspiritual. Numbers 20. Flip over to Numbers 20. It's not very far. You shouldn't have any problems finding it. Numbers 20. Now, you're going to have to come back to that. You kept that bulletin there, right? Okay, just checking. Numbers 20. See, the physical can become unspiritual. Just because you've been doing it the same way all this time, just because God's done it this way before, doesn't mean... You get to do it the exact same way the next time. You're still required to listen and obey God. Listen to the passage in verse 8. 
Now they got a say, they got a water problem, and God is telling Moses. He said, He says in verse eight, "Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water." So he gathers them up and he takes them out there. Verse eleven. Then Moses lifts up his hand and struck the rock twice, and with his rod and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beast drank. Wait a minute. Did y'all catch the disconnect there? God told him to do what? He told him to speak to it. Now, just because God told you to hit the rock in the past doesn't mean you do it that way again. Just going through the motions of worship. A lot of times when we come into the worship service, we go and, and, and we sit in the same pew every week. We sit in the same pew and we only shake the same hands right there around our circle. Can I tell you something? When you come into worship next time, why not ask God where you're supposed to sit? Why not look around and meet somebody new? Because God may be telling you constantly, you got to make a change. You got to make a change. You got to do it a little different than you've been doing it. Now is the time for change. And oh, don't you know that even though God gave them water, verse 12, they were consequences. He said, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. There are consequences when we disobey God. Now, God didn't let everybody else suffer. And sometimes we say, well, it didn't cost anybody else any problem. You ever hear somebody, well, I didn't hurt anybody else. Oh, let me tell you something. Who was hurt in the story? Who was hurt? Who was dishonored? God was dishonored. God, God's reputation, God's name cannot be denigrated, downplayed, or blasphemed in any way. There's an old word for you. God must be honored. If God says don't sleep around, don't sleep around. If God says don't sh share gossip, don't share gossip. We do it God's way, not the way that makes us feel okay or keeps us happy with our kids or moms and dads and everybody else. We do it God's way, the way God instructs us to do it. That's not my idea. That's God's word. And what did I tell you when we started? Everything we do, all practice and behavior is based on the word of God. If you've got a problem with it, take it up with him. Listen. We have zero control over the power in which God uses. Remember, we feel, when, when we receive Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And all the power that created the universe resides within us. But can I tell you something? Come up close. You and I have zero control control over that power only God has the power only God is able and it's only accessed when we do according to his will it is only accessed when we do and act according to his instructions he may he, he may he may bless somebody through it despite you I guarantee you he's blessed a few people in my life despite me. But there are consequences. And God's name should never be dishonored or disrespected. Back over to Exodus 17. You see, he went out Verse 6, you know, you pick up where it says, You shall strike the rock, and water will come forth, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the, of the elders of Israel. Why were they there? Why were they there? It was to prove that Moses didn't just go find a stream or some little creek or some, whatever, some little watering hole somewhere. It was to prove that God and God alone made water come from the rock. 
Water only comes from God and God alone. The water of life only comes from God himself. The witnesses were there so that they could go and spread the good news. Because it was a God thing. Do you know the reason God keeps springing up the water of life in your life? Boy, that is going to work on that. Is because we're supposed to go forth and tell our neighbors and friends where we got the water of life from. We're supposed to talk about the God thing and the God change and the God forgiveness that we receive. We're supposed to be completely and totally dependent upon him, reaching out for our every need, trusting in his power, and then telling everybody, uh, telling everybody else about what God has done. Verse 7. He named the place Massa Mur and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? A church is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord with us or not? Because their, their big spiritual problem was is they were living as if God was not with them. They were acting as if God was not alive and active and real. And God took them to a place of complete dryness where there was no water so he could settle for them that he's there and he's able and he's getting it done. You see, God is there even when our physical actions say he's not. Are you living a life where your spiritual and physical actions Line up. Is God alive in your life? Or is he some good luck charm that you ring the bell to? Is he just that little, little sign as you're walking out of the locker room or the doorknob and you just hit it before you go play the game? Because can I tell you something? God doesn't want to be a mascot. God doesn't want to be your lucky charm. God wants to be your everything. Everything. The Bible says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Oh. You know, 1 Corinthians 10.3, Paul talks about this passage and he says and all ate the spiritual food that's talking about the manna, manna and all drank the spiritual drink he's talking about the rock water from the rock for they were drinking a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ nevertheless with most of them God was not pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Christian, are you living a God-pleasing life? A God-honoring life? Or are you just playing church? Today is the day to get that right. Today is the day of repentance and restoration. Today is the day of change. Not something like a New Year's resolution, but you seek God with all your heart and by His power, by His hand, you will be changed. For some of you who are sitting here today, you've never received God's forgiveness. You've never known Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus said in Revelation 21, 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to you the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. If you would like to experience forgiveness and eternal salvation, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of response. I'll be standing right down here. And me or one of our counselors will share with you from God's word what you need to know to be saved. There's no reason for a Christian to ever be spiritually dry when the water of life is always available to us. Let us pray. Father, you are...